Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian, and I'm delighted to add my welcome to those many that you have received since coming. Welcome to the class of 2016. Before we begin, may I ask the class of 2016 and everyone else please to turn off any mobile device or anything that makes noise during this presentation. The University Library is thrilled to partner with the Office of the Provost to bring you the Marino Family International Writers Academic Workshop, now in its 18th year. And we're very pleased to give you, the newest members of the Georgetown family, the opportunity to engage with our faculty, your fellow students, and most especially with this year's author, Thea Obrecht, your first introduction to the intellectual life of the university. The Tiger's Wife is Ms. Obrecht's extraordinary debut novel, and now, by sharing our perspectives, we can enrich and deepen our understanding of the book, along with the understanding of the process of writing. We're very excited that Ms. Obrecht has agreed to be here today. The Marino International Writers' Workshop is the gift of Fred and Peggy Marino, and I invite you to join me now in thanking them, not only for being here today, but for their gift to Georgetown. Fred, Peggy. Many people have worked extremely hard over many months to bring this wonderful program to fruition. I want to thank the Marino Workshop Committee of Faculty and Staff and the offices of the President, the Provost, Student Affairs, New Student Orientation, and the staff of the University Library. Thanks also to all the mentors who have volunteered their time today, of course to Thea Obrecht, and to all of you who have read this amazing novel and have prepared papers about it to discuss in the workshop groups that will follow. One of the most enjoyable experiences in life is to read for pleasure, and we are fortunate to live in a society that values the culture of reading. We are also fortunate at Georgetown to have the support of the Marino family who embrace, embrace this culture fully. Alumnus Fred Marino and his family endowed this workshop in honor of his father, Joseph Marino. Fred understands the culture of reading and shares Georgetown's vision for this workshop, a collegial means of engaging the entire class of new students in the life of the mind through the thoughtful reading of a text by a major international novelist. At prestigious universities like Georgetown, you will be offered numerous opportunities every day we ask you to participate in this workshop because we know it is unique. Two previous authors honored at this workshop have won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and who knows, you may now be sitting in the presence of another future Nobel Prize winner. Enjoy the opportunity to listen to a young author's ideas and to ask questions after Ms. Obrecht gives her presentation. At that time, we'll invite you to come to the microphone at the center aisle with your questions. We'll also invite you to keep your questions brief so as many people as possible can come. I now have the privilege to introduce today Georgetown's President, John J. DeJoya. President DeJoya graduated from the university with both a bachelor's and a doctoral degree, and he has served as senior administrator and faculty member. He has been president of Georgetown since 2001, and through his vision, collaborations, and innovations, he continues to define and strengthen Georgetown University as a premier institution for education and research. Please join me now in welcoming President DeJoya. Thanks, very much. Well, thank you very much, Artemis. It's a pleasure to be with you all today for this special event in the intellectual life of our community. Yesterday we were assembled right here in McDonough Gymnasium for our new student convocation. During that ceremony, as you officially entered our community, you heard lessons and encouragement from members of your new Georgetown family, from individuals who provided you with a glimpse of life on our campus and the promise and possibility that each of you represent. And now you're back here today. You all look a little more relaxed. We take another step on our journey together. As Artemis just indicated, each year new Georgetown students have participated in this workshop, all thanks to the Marino family's generous and ongoing support 
of the International Writers Academic Workshop, and I too want to thank Fred and Peggy for their generous support of Georgetown in making all of this possible. Through this workshop, we seek to open our academic year with a common shared experience that provides all of our entering students, along with members of our faculty and staff, with a chance to engage and celebrate a piece of contemporary international fiction and to have an opportunity to meet the writer. We will have many shared experiences as we all build our lives together in this community. This is one of them. Today we're here to continue this tradition with author Taya Obrecht as we discuss her critically acclaimed first book and winner of the 2011 Orange Prize for Fiction, The Tiger's Wife. Born in 1985 in Belgrade in the former Yugoslavia, Ms. Obrecht and her family left her country of birth just as war broke out in the Balkans. Her early years were spent in Cyprus and Egypt before she emigrated to the United States. These early experiences marked by conflict and travel have shaped the perspective that she brings to the tiger's wife and the interest that her novel takes in history, loss, and the resilient spirit of the people in the Balkan region. She has spoken of the importance of place in her writing. To quote her, I am very interested in place and the influences of place on characters. What inspires me most is to write, to write is the act of traveling. I like to explore the idea of common conflict and perhaps a more amplified environment in my writing. In her young career, she has already generated great acclaim for her prodigious talent for storytelling and imagery. And that is reflected not only in The Tiger's Wife, but also in her many short stories. Her story, The Laugh, was selected in the anthology of Best American Short Stories in 2010. She was named by The New Yorker as one of the 20 best American fiction writers under 40. In fact, she was the youngest at 24 when named in 2010. And she's included in the National Book Foundation's list of five under 35. She is published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times, The Guardian. In 2009, she graduated with an MFA in creative writing from Cornell. The book we discuss today, The Tiger's Wife, centers on the narrator, Natalia, her experience of loss and the coming together of people after times of turmoil. It draws upon the history of the conflict in the Balkans and its reconstruction. Natalia, after losing her grandfather, seeks reconciliation and the retelling of his stories. Her search for meaning helps us to think about how stories animate our lives and how they are handed down across generations. The New York Times has praised the tiger's wife for the way it engages the very essence of storytelling and explores how the retelling of past events can provide us with a greater understanding of our present moment. Our conversation today and our discussions afterward in small groups enable us to think about how this story, the complex histories it evokes and its blending of reality with imagination relates to the stories that have brought us all here together. These are stories that inform your unique perspectives on this text and which will shape our shared Georgetown experience, our shared Georgetown narrative in the coming years. So I wish to thank all of you for your engagement with such a compelling novel. It's our privilege to hear directly from the author and now it's my pleasure to welcome to Georgetown Ms. Taya Obrecht and invite her to the podium. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction um, and uh, for having me here in the first place. Um, thank you to the Marino family for uh, running such an incredible program. Um, 
that I'm truly privileged to be a part of. Uh, and thank you all for being here. This is a first for me. I haven't had um, the book read this way by an entire community. Um, thank you for reading it, first of all, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm glad it's Monday. I realize that your number probably might have been cut in half if it were like Thursday. Um, I, know it's your <laughs> I know it's your first week. Uh, welcome. That's, um, that's great. I envy you. Um, I'm not in college anymore. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm here to talk about uh, the writing process uh, in general. Uh, which, uh, as President DeJoa said, uh, really um, has to do with story and life stories. And it's uh, kind of amazing that you talked about the uh, shared experience of uh, Georgetown narrative because uh, some of that has to do with what um, I want to talk about today. Um, the writing process, uh, I think, is inextricably linked to the process of living and absorbing and allowing your world to expand and make an impact on you, uh, all of which is about to start happening in your own lives on a massive and unprecedented scale, if it hasn't already, which I suspect it has been for the majority of your lives, but more so now, because now you're out here and your parents are somewhere else and now you're here. Um, I, uh, I wrote this book technically in three years, but I only just realized that I've been writing it my entire life. Um, and I realized it because I spent the last three months living in my parents' basement um, with boxes of my belongings. I, uh, I was supposed to move into a new place in Manhattan, but the construction was delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, and I was supposed to move in in May, and my lease ran out. And then, like May 5th, I showed up on my mom's doorstep with suitcases and was like, I hope you still love me, because here I am with everything I own, um, which included boxes of notes uh, relating to the tiger's wife, some of which date back to the early 1600s, I think. Um, I'm, uh, I'm originally from Yugoslavia, when it was Yugoslavia, it's not anymore. Um, I was born in Belgrade, which is now Serbia, um, to a multi-ethnic, multi-religious household um, that still had a foothold in socialism at the time. Um, but my grandmother uh, is Muslim, my grandfather was Roman Catholic, um, and my stepdad is Serbian Orthodox, so in my house, even to this day, it's Christmas twice a year. Um, once with the great joy of December 25th, where we give presents and eat a lot, and then uh, later on in early January, when there are no presents, and you eat unleavened cake, and everybody is very somber. I don't know. I like the first variety better. Um, I, um, the war came to uh, Yugoslavia when I was very young, and I was pretty much unaware of what was going on, but you know, generally acquainted with the idea of some sort of conflict and the fact that people were turning off the TV whenever I would come into the room, like I would very small, and I'd walk in, and immediately CNN was on, and then it would not be on anymore. And then I would walk out, and then I would hear it turn on. Um, this is a Balkan way of sheltering your children from the truth. Um, and uh, because we were in a multi-ethnic family, uh, it was necessary very early on to leave, and we went to Cyprus, uh, which, <laughs> which uh, if you know, is a small island in the Mediterranean um, that's half Turkish and half Greek. Um, so it was not like we didn't go from one conflict to another. Uh, we were on the Greek side. And there, I was introduced to English, uh, which I had previously been learning almost entirely from bootleg Disney tapes that were brought to me by my grandfather. Um, and I knew how to, I knew almost all these tapes by heart and had no idea what I was saying, but I would walk around the house reciting Bambi or whatever and drove my mother crazy. Um, but, uh, so I was introduced to English, reading, writing, speaking with comprehension. Um, and I realized at that time, 
on this very small island that nevertheless had an incredible history uh, that I was very interested in stories. I mean, Cyprus was a place where crusaders would stop over on the way to Jerusalem, um, and it had all these castles and Greek ruins and a tremendous amount of history, and you know, I was small, and they would give me a hat and walk me around to all these places and say, isn't this cool? Um, and I would say, yes, it's very cool. Um, I'm still a nerd. I was a nerd then, but I'm also a nerd now. Um, and in all this exposure to story and history, I realized that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I remember being eight years old in Cyprus and my mother having uh, a laptop computer. That was like the parting gift from Yugoslavia. And now you guys don't have access, I think, to this particular kind of memory because you're still kind of young. But laptops back then were like, this thick and this wide, and it was still a laptop, and you would carry it in like a cart with wheels. I mean, it was, you know, it was not really any lighter than a regular computer, and she had a laptop, and I, I wanted to have access to it. I wanted to play with it. I mean, it was like a baby brother or a puppy. It was it's cool. It was in the house. And um, she said that I couldn't unless I was there on the pretense of doing something productive. So I wrote a short paragraph about a goat who has a really bad day um, and printed it on, you know, the printer, and, um, and took it to my mom and I said, I'm gonna be a writer, because look, I have a paragraph about a goat, and she said, that's great, I hope you have a backup. <laughs> and I did, uh, no, um, no I didn't. Uh, after Cyprus, uh, after Cyprus we moved to Egypt. Um, and that was, I mean, another amazing exposure to story and uh, being in a place that was completely connected to its history in a very intimate way was overwhelming for me. Egypt is the kind of place where you go to uh, the market and the building that it's housed in has been standing for upwards of a thousand years and there's the building which used to be you know, the, the side part of some temple and on top of it is a mosque and uh, that's no longer in use but it's there, you know, because the topography changes and as the political and religious topography changes too. Um, and everybody has a different story about the cornerstone that was laid in that building. You know, somebody will say, oh, Napoleon's men totally laid this cornerstone and it doesn't matter that that doesn't fit the chronology of the actual building. Um, and people are always selling you trinkets that supposedly have this amazing history. I mean, I can't tell you how many little jewels I have from Egypt that were like belonged to Ramses, you know. Um, but that's how it's sold. And everything has a story and everything has this life of its own. But the other thing that was extraordinary and terrifying for me was that it's a place that's very much in tune still with the idea of death. Um, there is a city of the dead in Cairo where people live on top of crypts, family crypts. Um, I learned a lot about Egyptian mythology which centers entirely on the idea of death. And I remember being, you know, 10 years old in, in Egypt and my grandmother came in and found me crying on the floor face down on an encyclopedia. And she said, what's, what, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? And I said, oh, I, I, I'm crying. And she opened the encyclopedia to the, she peeled me off it and realized that I had been looking at skeletal structure and that it had hit me that these bones which were inside the ground and inside the pyramids and inside this encyclopedia were inside me too. So there's your deathless man um, in that. And I was, I was deeply traumatized by it. But again, um, the idea of story was there and it was ever present and I started to write so that by the time we moved to the US, which was a tremendous culture shock for me, going from a school of 60 students total to this, which was my high school size, one class maybe, um, was absolutely horrifying to me um, as a nerdy foreign kid who like had only ever watched Disney movies and knew absolutely nothing about pop music and was completely confused by everything. Um, so writing became an escape, and I read more and more and more. Um, and somehow, in all of that uh, writing, which had been sort of a theoretical plan for one day, became the ultimate and absolute plan, and I went to USC to study creative writing. Um, and it felt very surreal, and college was a 
strange experience, as you will find out, because somehow it seems like an immersion in a great deal of material that seems very relevant, but not right now, and, and not necessarily to your life, and you don't quite know how to apply it. Um, but I started writing short stories, and I wrote one about a character who ended up being the Deathless Man later, but I didn't know it, and I tore it up and threw it away. Um, but I found it in the box recently, so I guess I didn't throw as much of it away as I thought. Um, anyway, I, uh, after college, <laughs> I was still uh, hell-bent on becoming a writer, and uh, learned that there was these fantastic things called MFA programs where apparently they pay you to sit in a room all day and write and that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and I applied and got into Cornell, which was a miracle <laughs> for me. Um, and I was immensely looking forward to it and then something very strange happened. Uh, my grandfather, who had been, with whom I had lived my whole life, um, because it was just my grandparents and my mom, uh, passed away quite suddenly. Uh, he had had cancer and he died and he was in Serbia um, the, the week that I graduated from college. And uh, I thought, well, this is horrifying and I don't know quite how to process it, but whatever, I'll wear black for a couple of weeks and it feels very strange, but I think that's how you're supposed to grieve. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to this new place at Cornell and, and I will be a writer there and I'm so excited to be a writer and that will, that will mean great things and he, he would have wanted this for me and um, sort of shoved all that strange feeling under the rug and moved on and went to Ithaca to be a writer. And my fantasy of this, uh, for which I was very excited, was that there would be, you know, a great deal of us there who were all in the middle of projects and, and you know, thinking about books and writing and reading and, you know, Ithaca, this place on the East Coast. There are no seasons in California where I had been living. I was so excited for the idea of seasons. Um, and, you know, I felt like this contributes greatly to, you know, to one's status as a writer. Like, in, in the winter, you must write more, you know, and in the spring, you must write about flowery things. It's going to be great. And... Um, I get there and it's great, fall comes, you know, everything turns orange the way it does here and like falls. And I was super excited about that. And I had, you know, this little subterranean, subterranean apartment and I was like, I will just all day long, I will make coffee and write and drink the coffee and then write more and it'll be great. I'm feeling wonderful. And then um, the first snow fell. And after like the third or fourth time that I dug up the wrong snowbank thinking it was my car because when you initially scratch it, it's the right color, but then when you unearth the whole thing, you're like, that's not my car. <laughs> oh no. Um, I was like, okay, I've had enough of seasons. I'm gonna pack up my stuff and go back to California. I hate this. And I had a, uh, you know, I wasn't writing as much as I thought I was because I was spending all my time shoveling snow. and. I had this subterranean, again, subterranean apartment that was very strange. I didn't realize this when I signed the lease. You stand underground and the window is at floor level, but it's at waist level for you. So when it starts to snow, you're standing in your little place and you're looking at it and it's going up like an hourglass and it's just burying you. You know, you've got like a little sticker that says help and then once it's gone, you're done, you're buried, it's over. Um, but suddenly you have a lot of impetus and time and uh, nothing else to do but write. Um, so I was in my apartment writing and writing and writing and writing a lot of stuff that I hated and a lot of short stories that were being destroyed in workshop, but we were all excited, we were all there. And uh, one day, uh, in the middle of a blizzard, I was watching the National Geographic channel because, yes, I'm still a nerd. And they had, you know, some sort of marathon about big cats. I don't know. Maybe it's called Big Cat Week. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, and they had this program about tigers, about this Russian researcher who raises tigers in, in the wilds of Siberia and studies them. And he had this wife um, who was, you know, in her 70s, and there were these big, very angry cats, and she would come up to the fence where they were being held and talk them out of these enormous rages. And something about it really appealed to me, I don't know what, sat down, wrote a short story called The Tiger's Wife about a young deaf mute woman who uh, comes to a village in search of her escaped circus tiger. And somehow, without any sort of 
uh, agenda for this, it ended up being set in the Balkans, and I had never set anything on the home ter turf before, and I thought, this is weird, I'd, what, what's, what's with this? But oh well. And it had a little boy uh, whose stories of childhood somehow rem resembled like a little bit the stories of my grandfather's childhood, like a bit, but I was like, oh, that's unrelated too. <laughs> it's nothing to do with anything. But I was very excited about the short story and took it to workshop the following week and got ripped to shreds. I can't explain how bad it was. The short story was terrible and uh, everybody hated it. And uh, one of my good friends, who is uh, a writer now as well, um, said in workshop, this story has pitchforks in it, like pitchfork wielding rabble. And uh, yet the story is not Frankenstein, so I don't think that pitchforks should ever be in any piece of literature that is not Frankenstein. And I was like, that's a very good comment, you know. <laughs> very good, very good. And uh, so I dare you to find a pitchfork in the book now because it's all been taken out. Oh, no more pitchforks. Um, and I was completely disheartened, but still attached to the project somehow. There was this little boy that I was starting to picture as sort of, I don't know, and this girl and this tiger, and I, I felt very attached to them, um, which is, you know, attachment to subject matter that I did not know at the time was derivative of my cumulative life experience. Um, the, you know, the idea of death and a deathless man who suddenly came in off the street to be a figure of the grandfather's life because suddenly this little boy was the grandfather of a narrator and he had a story of his own and he had a life that he had lived and he had spent it in weird places and still, you know, writing it. I was like, this has nothing to do with my life because Barth says that it has, you know, the death of the author. It has nothing to do with the actual subject matter. Um, and it resonated and it felt real. And in this short story, I learned the value of editing, which you're going to learn soon if you haven't already, um, but very soon, because uh, the short story at 25 pages was utter garbage. And then I wrote more and wrote more and wrote more and tried to fix it. And suddenly it was 35 pages and it was still garbage. And I could tell now that it was garbage and I was like, oh my God, I don't know. So. Maybe if I make it longer and put more things in it, the garbage will be diluted. So, you know, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly you're at like 60 pages and it's like less bad because sure enough in all that scrambling, you've ended up with something that you can actually use. So then you take out the stuff that is bad and you add more and now it's worse. But then you spend more time with it and now it's better. And before I knew it, I had 85 pages of a short story that was going absolutely nowhere. And I had a revelation that I did not expect to happen as it did. When we had come in as MFAs, you, you came in writing short stories and you thought one day, some glorious day, I will write a novel and I will know it is the right day for me to write a novel because I will go to workshop after a night of having deliberated with myself whether or not I was ready to write a novel. And everyone would look at me and say, you have a radiance on you and you're really sweaty. So what is going on? And you would say, so I've been thinking about it and I, I'm ready to write a novel. This will be a great experience for me. It is a great time in my life. Isn't it a great time for all of us? Who's with me? And then they would hoist you up in on their shoulders and carry you about the room because you were gonna write a novel. And instead it was, this is really garbage at 25 pages and it's garbage at 35 and I like it a little bit better at 60 and I guess at 85 I can't sh call it a short story anymore. And then you go to workshop and you're like, I think I'm writing a novel. I, I, I think I finally started a novel. And everyone would be like, you're deluded, no, no, you're not ready. And you're like, oh, okay. But that's how it began. Um, and it was, a, it was a very strange experience because my family at the time, they were still living abroad and they were still traveling and like every Christmas I'd go and visit them and be like, oh. And um, you know, anything I saw sounded like, a, like an interesting thing that would somehow make it into the novel and most of it didn't, most of it ended up in the trash. But some of those things that you don't think are gonna stay with you, do and they start to mutate and they turn into something that becomes really significant in the work until you can't even recognize them anymore. 
Um, and then when you sit down on your parents' floor and go through your notes, you're like, oh, I remember where this came from. Wow. Uh, which I feel like is an experience that generally happens in life. I mean, I've started to feel that way about almost everything now, so good luck. Um, when the novel was finally finished, the novel was finally finished um, and had gone through two rounds of edits, we sent it to the Dial Press and my editor bought it <laughs> inexplicably um, and began a whole different editing process. But I still felt that parts of it were not connected to Yugoslavia, were still not connected to my life, didn't really mean anything. and. Uh, I didn't get in touch with a lot of it until I went back to Serbia on assignment for Harper's Magazine uh, to hunt vampires, uh, which, I, which is a true story and for a nonfiction piece and I believe is very relevant because at, at this time, and at that time and this time too, there was like a vampire takeover happening. I don't know if you heard about it. Like people were reading this book called Twilight. I don't know. Maybe some of you read it. Maybe some of you still have it in the nightstand. Um, all your shelves lined with it. Anyway, um, Twilight was going on, and the Harpers wanted to know where vampires came from originally, and turns out they actually come from the Balkans. And I went there, and my assignment was to go from house to house, knocking on people's doors in these villages that we had vaguely heard of that were connected to vampire lore, and go, knock, knock. And then when somebody would open the door, you would say, hi, you don't know me, I'm an American journalist, and uh, I, I'd like to talk to you about your vampire. Do you have a minute? And then one of two things would happen. They would either slam the door in your face really, really hard, uh, which happened more often than not, or they would say, yeah, and like invite you in and give you a tremendous amount of rakia, which is this Serbian liquor that's like turpentine, and you would have to drink three or four shots of this as like a rite of passage to get to the place where everybody would be ready to tell you about their vampires. And then all these stories would come out, and you'd be like, my grandfather is around the corner in the room, he's 97, and he dug up a vampire one time, and you'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I had no idea, still, in this experience, that it was related in any way to my writing, but I went home and suddenly felt like I had gotten in touch with a part of the Balkans and a part of my own identity and a part of the writing process that I had never known before, and took my book back from my poor editor, who had been, who had already finished it practically and was turning it into the presses, uh, and stayed with it for another six months. And I think at that time, it really did hit me that everything you do in any aspect of your life is somehow material for something else, for who you are and who you're going to become and what your preoccupations are. Everything you read, uh, all the music that you listen to, you're changing tastes in what you read and what you're watching and your music. Um, you know, the fact that you ridicule yourself from five years ago and you're like, man, I can't believe that I used to like I don't know what it is now, but like, I don't know, 10, 10, 12 years ago, I was all about the Backstreet Boys, like everybody else in my, you guys are like, antiques. Um, but, you know, as everybody else in my generation was. Um, and, you know, the fact that you are not in touch anymore with that part of yourself and those aesthetics from 10 years ago, it's still relevant because you may use it somehow in, 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 your art or your work or your connection to the people that you end up working with in college, after college. Um, and it's a very strange and, and um, amazing thing. Um, so, uh, I guess that's, that's really about narrative arc. So, um, narrative arc isn't something that just happens in literature, it's something that also applies on a daily basis and um, your life will follow a narrative of highs and lows and triumphs and tragedies and uh, they're all yours for better or for worse whether you like them or not, whether you hide them in your, under your bed uh, or try to conceal them from future loved ones um, and uh, they'll reflect on other parts of your life in ways that you never imagined or won't understand immediately uh, and will only then come to terms with. Uh, so that's what I learned in the writing process of this book. Um, 
and I would actually be really, really happy now to, because I understand that you guys have read it and responded to it, and I'm really, really happy to answer questions, which is my favorite part of any talk. Um, so please uh, ask anything here at the mic, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> Tia is ready, willing, and able to answer questions. You've all been thinking about this novel. You've written papers about the novel. You're about to discuss it in a workshop. But this is the opportunity to hear straight from the author what it is that she was thinking in relation to some of the questions that you might have. So won't you please come to the center aisle? We have some time for a Q&A. And she would love to hear from you. There you go. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was really good. No, sure. Um, there's been a lot of debate about this on the official GAP page, which really shows you how our priorities are. But why is the deathless man so thirsty? Wow. Why is he so thirsty? That's a, that's a good question. Um, oh, my. I just learned something about myself. I don't know what it is. Um, it's, <laughs> um, I think it has to do with sort of a, 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 the subconsciously, all the metaphors in this, I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now, and half of you are gonna leave from the mic. Uh, mo <laughs> most of the metaphors that ended up in this book uh, were subconsciously rendered. I think that uh, at times, your choices as a writer have to do with uh, diction and flow and sort of the muscle of the sentence rather than I, you know, I never wrote with like, and tiger will mean, you know, the, uh, the, the you know, the, the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the, and, the, and the problems of Balkan politics are symbolized entirely by the tiger. It's, it's something that sort of happens as, as the novel's going on and you learn about it in the, in the trajectory of it. But I, I guess recently I've learned uh, in reading about mythology, that water uh, has a lot to do with the subconscious, and that whenever a character is immersed in water or has anything to do with water, it's actually getting in touch with uh, the subconscious. So that's why. <laughs> that's, that's how come. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I feel like I have to ask myself a lot now. Thank <laughs> you. Next. Um, why did you choose to leave most of the geographic names either fictitious or unspecified? Um, I, I chose that. That was one of three conscious choices that happened in the book. One was like, they're going to be doctors. Uh, one was, uh, and, and actually that was two of them. They're unspecified and then nobody's re related to any living person. But um, the, the, the choice for that was, um, you know, I grew up at a time when the Balkan conflict was very heavily publicized in the media. There was uh, a great deal of conversation about it. It's still very raw and, and I think very fresh. Um, and coming from a mixed family, I didn't want to get bogged down in the politics of it. I wanted to write a story about stories and about people and sort of try to capture the essence of what it meant to be from Yugoslavia. Um, and I felt like the minute you pinpoint it to one particular place, suddenly there's this issue of um, not just uh, the specifics of the conflict, which then require you to be like, well, if, if I'm over here on you know, June 5th of, of 1992, then this other thing can't be going on narratively. It's a narrative constriction. But also, um, the fact that you, know, you begin to make political statements about things that, that aren't necessarily what you want the work to be about. And I did not want to write a political statement. Um, and uh, that was why. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See, I knew the answer to that one. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I was wondering about the tiger's wife as a character. Mm -hmm. You being a female writer, why did you make her so vulnerable to like the characters like the butcher and then her family? But then her sister, 
was a strong woman in the book, but then she winds up dying. Like, what was the role of women in your book, basically? I think that it's, um, I mean, in, in a way, it, it, it was an attempt to show the range of possible experiences. Um, I, feel, I feel that many societies still to this day, but especially at the time of, um, that the time it's supposed to be happening in, in the uh, early 40s, um, you know, there's a lot of patriarchal societies. Um, women are often victimized. W women were victimized then. Women are victimized still. Um, I wanted, though, in particular, the tiger's wife, who's deaf mute. Um, she ended up being, in, in being unable to tell her own story and her own version of events, she is subject entirely to the story making of everyone around her. And the stories that are made up about the tiger involve her too. However, in that, there is a certain amount of power because in, in the mystery of not knowing what was actually going on, she does end up exerting a tremendous amount of influence over the village and the hysteria that, that, that unfolds. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. Um, and, and I think that, I mean, that's something that often happens in, in, in um, not just literature, but in isolated societies. I mean, the person you know nothing about ends up being this figure of, you know, horror or admiration or um, mystery. And I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. So that's, that's thank the, you. thank you. Um, for part of our written exercise, we were supposed to think about some of the themes and the motifs of the book. And while I felt like I understood a couple like recurrent um, motifs like death and um, like the impact of war on the innocent, I wasn't sure if I, I, I wasn't really sure what you meant as like a central message. So did you have like a, a, a certain theme that you wanted us to take away or was it more left up to us? I think that, um, I mean, death was certainly a central theme of it. Um, and I think that in trying to cope with my grandfather's death and trying to understand what death really means, I mean, the, the absolute certainty of death um, and what that uh, means and the impact that it has, um, I think it ended up taking over the novel in ways that I didn't expect. Um, and everybody in the novel ends up going through some sort of loss and, and interacting with death or the figure of death in some way. Um, however, as for a central message, I feel like that, that differs. Um, I, as a reader, uh, like to engage with literature that means something to me on a personal level. And I think that whenever you try to get everybody, whenever you think of an audience in universal terms and you say to yourself, everybody will feel this way at the end of this book, and I want them to feel this and this and this, you're setting yourself up for a world of difficulty um, and probably the reader for a, a strange writing experience because the, the things in the novel that stuck with you as a reader, uh, or in this novel or any other novel, are different from the person standing behind you. And um, it depends on what you're going through in your own life, the way you, you know, did you like it or did you not? Um, is it something that you're gonna return to later on? Uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a strange thing. So I think that th what I was trying to do for myself in writing it was cope with death and the idea of family and explore Balkan history in a way that wasn't um, direct. And, you know, hopefully, you got some of that too. But um, if you got other things from it, I'm, I'm, you know, that makes me even more excited because suddenly it applied to your life in a different way or to your aesthetic understanding in a different way. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, thank Hi. you very much for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, considering the novel has a lot to do with storytelling and myth versus reality, um, how reliable all the, narr all the different perspectives were, especially the grandfather's stories. So as an author, do you believe that all of his stories were true or do you not know? Like, especially the deathless man, was that definitely a reality in your mind or is it up to the reader to guess? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether, whether or not um, I believe it. It matters whether you believe. That's such a like a weird. <laughs> oh, all that matters is, but um, it's true. 
uh, I, 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 you know, narrative, narr a narrator's unreliability is something really, really interesting to me and always has been. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of narrators in this book that can't be accounted for completely, but it also has to do with the state of mind. Um, I think that what matters more is whether or not Natalia believes it, and then how the reader responds to that. Um, I was reading recently, I was reading Joseph Campbell recently, this is how all my sentences begin now, I'm sorry, it's been a good summer. Um, uh, he's, a, he's sort of a mythologist and he talks about um, the impact of, of uh, sort of like universal mythology and how people um, create myths and the point of, of myth and, and the way story operates. And uh, he was talking about the difference between, um, he was talking about Plains cultures, like Native American Plains Indians, and their response to uh, the animals that they were killing for sustenance. And he said that uh, there's a very distinct difference between a psyche that sees an it in an object, in an animal, in a story, and a psyche that sees a thou in, a, in an object or an animal in a story. And I think that, having read that now, Natalia is on the cusp of trying to make that distinction. And that has to do with whether or not she believes is it, are the, you know, are the myths real or not has to do with being on that precipice. Will it mean something more to her to believe that they are real or will it mean something less? And I think that, you know, that's the best answer I can give. You look confused and I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You're like, that's not what I wanted. Thank you. Uh, first of all, zdravo i hvala puno što si došla ovde. Zdravo, hvala um, Yes, I'm originally from Belgrade, and whenever I go back every summer, I notice a sense of worry in, among the people. Everyone's very sort of, a lot of fear. And, um, and I always think of that as, do you think of that as sort of like the root of this, these superstitions that, and creating this fear that, that unifies um, all people from, from everywhere in the uh, Balkans? Absolutely, and I, and I think that it's a, it's a very interesting thing because those superstitions precede um, the religions that, the, about which the conflict arose. Um, I mean, I don't know how it is in your family. I suspect that you guys have your own superstitions, but like my grandmother, for instance, my grandmother, um, my grandmother's very Balkan, and like there are all these things that you can and cannot do. Like you can't, um, if you leave on a journey, okay, even if it's like I'm going down the street, to uh, get, I don't know, flowers, I'll be back. And you know, I, I get to the elevator and I'm like, oh, I forgot the money. So I turn around and she's already slamming the door in my face. She's like, go to the corner and then come back. And you have to, you know, if you, you complete a journey, then you come back. You can't come back from the threshold. You can't cross over it. Um, I remember when I, when I went vampire hunting, my grandmother had, um, I dropped something under the bed and looked under there to pick it up and there were scissors under the bed, like just a couple of pairs of scissors under the bed with the blades open and I was like, Grandma, all your scissors are under the bed. Like, do you want me to get them out? She's like, no, the evil will come get you in your sleep. You leave them there. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, all kinds of, like we spit, like I don't know how it is again, but like we spit at babies. Like you can't praise a baby because it will bring bad luck to the baby. You can't say like, what a beautiful newborn, like I'm so happy for you, you know, mazel tov. You have to be like, oh, I'm so sorry that your child is so ugly. <laughs> because then like the evil won't hear you, you know, the evil will be like, oh, there's an ugly child down there somewhere, like leave it, you know, I, I don't, you know, like. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from, but like I, I, it was a very difficult thing transitioning to the States as a result because you get here and you're like, what a hideous newborn, and people are like, what? <laughs> so instead, you know, you develop this way of being like, oh, what a beautiful baby, toot, toot, toot. And like when you say toot, 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 what you're really doing is spitting symbolically on their child. They don't know this because you try spitting on somebody's kid on the street here and see how that works out for you. But. But um, I think that there is this undercurrent of fear, like bad things will happen if you talk about bad things. Bad things will talk about if you happen about good th talk about good things. Like good things mean bad things will happen. Bad things mean bad things will happen. You know, don't just bad things will happen. And I don't know. I mean, I think. <laughs> 
which sort of also informs the way I generally am in life. Like this whole year has been very difficult for me. It's been a really good year and there's like falling anvils everywhere, I'm sure. I'm just like inches away from being hit by a piano. But um, I, think, <laughs> I think that that has to do with, if you're a culture that's you know, at a crossroads of, of major empires and every three weeks, you know, some new horde is coming in with like their pennants and their horses and their cannons. They're like, oh, it's mine now. You know, you're like, okay, what's going to happen next week? And I think that that, you know, that breeds that kind of fear and insecurity, which then sort of bleeds culturally into other things. So that was a really long response. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, ultimately, did you intend for the Deathless Man to genuinely be a mystical figure, or is he really a gen uh, phrasing? Sorry, or is he really uh, more a figment of superstition? Well, I think that um, again, it has to do with, with with the belief of the characters and your own belief as a reader. The Deathless Man comes from. He's one of the only figures in the book that comes from actual mythology. He's uh, he's derived from. Um, this figure in a, in a German and Slavic folktale called Godfather Death. And uh, usually he's this like village idiot, like the stereotype, he's like the third son of a third son and he's, you know, he's kind of a village idiot and like he's always making trouble. And um, in some episode he like trips or, tra like, trips or tricks or captures death in some way and is then punished with either immediate death or immediate disqualification. Like, no more for you, and like death, you know, wanders off and then he spends his life wandering looking for death. I mean, the, the, the point of that story in, in culture typically is to acquaint you, you know, acquaint the audience with the, like, the value of, of death in society. And like, in the Balkans, that's very real. It's like, you're gonna die. You are, you know, and you're like, oh, okay, you know. Um, as per our discussion about superstition earlier, via piano or anvil. Um, but I, so in, in the book, I think the reason, that I, I, I started to write him as an understanding of how immortality could ever be a punishment. And in the beginning, the deathless man was really sinister, and I was, <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh, it's really subtle, you know. He's 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 a he's a figure related to death, but he looks nothing like death and acts nothing like death. He only wears like a dark coat and a dark hat, and you can't ever see his face. And he skulks around in corners with like an axe over one shoulder. He has nothing to do with the figure of death. Um, and it was really a terrifying experience writing him because my desk faces the corner. And so I would, you know, I would write and it would be three in the morning and I would write and then I would be like, and he walked into the room. <laughs> and keep going. But, um, but then he started to become sort of more sympathetic and like really puzzled and awkward in some ways. And um, I, I think that whether or not he is really deathless, his belief in his own deathlessness is what draws the grandfather to him um, in, in the conversations that they have. Um, and, and I think there's like a need for that kind of figure in the grandfather's life. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Um, throughout the novel, I realized that you rarely mention her parents. So what encouraged you to write um, the story with Natalia's relationship focusing on being with her grandparents? I, I mean, I think it certainly has to do something with my own upbringing, but I also think that on a very basic level, um, you know, there's a real fascination with grandparents, and I personally am very fascinated by the idea that, like, when my grandmother tells stories, even today, she's like, yeah, we had a radio, you know, it was like a like a radio the size of an elephant and like it had one knob on it and you had to, you know, somebody had to stand outside on the roof with, you know, a tin can and like let, you know, the, the waves come in that way. And to me that's really fascinating. I mean, there, grandparents in my life, but, but also probably in your lives as well, are these people who were around for a completely different era and their lives are full of mystery. And you know, they were somebody before you were here. You know, you, you got here and like the world began. You know, that's how, I feel like that's how I felt for the majority of, like until my brother was born. And then I was like, oh. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, grandparents are living proof that the world did not in fact begin when you got here, and there's like this fascinating, like they had lives before you. Um, so I think that was the draw of it, the connection to that kind of story. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi. Um, 
uh, in your novel, there are several uh, kind of characters that have these long, like, involved backstories, like Luca and the apothecary and Darisa the bear, but they really don't have much, like, immediate plot function, especially Darisa, whose entire purpose is to show up, be intimidating, and die. So um, what was the reason for throwing in these really, these characters with more depth than they necessarily need to have? Um, that sounded meaner than it was. Right? I had to hit a certain page limit. No. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, I, I think that it, it all started with Luca because what, what I wanted to do was, um, Luca originally had the purpose of being really intimidating, <laughs> showing up and dying. <laughs> but... Um, when you, I, I remember reading Roald Dahl when I was a kid, and he had written this sort of manifesto about things to do and things not to do. And I don't know how many of you read Roald Dahl, but even as adults, if you haven't read him as kids, you should read him as adults because he's twisted and awesome. Um, but uh, he said that you know, the, the the better they are, the harder they fall. You know what I mean? Like the, the more excited you are about the villain's level of battitude. Um, the, the, you know, the more excited you are to see their defeat. And uh, when I wrote Luca originally, I was like, he was a bad man, he was a very bad man, look at the bad man. And like, it was, you know, one paragraph about how bad he was. And then I was like, I don't believe that he's a bad man, he's just here to be a villain. So I wrote the backstory for Luca in order to understand him myself and understand uh, his behavior and his nuance. And then what ended up happening was it tapped into a different era, it tapped into different themes that I was interested in exploring as well. It somehow connected uh, to the idea of fear and superstition and fear of yourself. And then that latched on to, you know, it echoed other parts of the book. And I was like, this kind of, I think this belongs in here. Um, and then the same thing happened for Darisha, the fact that, that um, his past was connected in a way to the mutual past of, of, of the way the empire had fallen um, in order to make room for these new ideas that were happening at the time the grandfather was a kid. And um, so that's, that's how it started. And uh, it, it, I think that it expanded this, like it gave it more of a 3D feel, the world of the, the novel. So that's why. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. So what um, really got to me in the book was how you dealt with the political situation in the Balkans, especially with the ethnic strife, with the apothecary, with um, the newly separated borders and all of that. And I was just wondering, um, I mean, I really think why it stuck with me was because I'm the first generation of an Asian American family in America. And so I feel detached from China or Taiwan, but at the same time, I still have some connection to it. So I'm just wondering, how did you deal with um, feeling about the ethnic strife, if you had any personal feelings, and how did you keep it so neutral throughout the entire book, which I thought was done really well? Thank you. Um, I, I think that, you know, that has to do with the fact that I, I, I you know, being raised in a, in a, in a multi-ethnic household, there were, you know, there were certain rules of moral code that were ingrained. It was like, you will not have an opinion on, not, not have an opinion, but you will not choose sides. You know, people are choosing sides because the entire conflict had to do with um, people who had identified themselves as being a cumulative identity were now beginning to pick only certain parts of their identity. You know, I could just as easily pick to be Slovenian as I could to be Serbian, you know what I mean? And people did, and my family did not. So I felt a, a certain obligation to that, as, as, and that is, I mean, I, that is my view. I, I think that, that um, you know, I am extremely, as most people in this room probably are, um, uh, and very frustrated by the idea of conflict, particularly ethnic conflict. Um, and um, I wanted to give everything sort of a, a fair hand, uh, and and it was a you know it was a, it was a bit of a struggle because you don't want to you don't want to be like everybody's wonderful, but you also don't want to be like everybody's awful, you know, and and so um, that was uh, that was a struggle for me, but I, I definitely wanted to do it to be even handed in it in the exercise of it. So thank you, thanks. 
Hi, so you discussed how much everything in your life influenced what you ended up writing, how everything you carry with you does end up influencing so much of what you write. And I was hoping you could sort of explain the process you go through and the difficulties of finding that balance between exposing perhaps family secrets or values and respecting them and how much you invest of yourself into characters and sort of edit to make it um, more fictitious and uh, less perhaps hurtful or emotional or something. Sure. Um I, I think that uh, I, I always err on the side of, this is not me. Um, the, I, I think that um, one of the things that surprised me most about writing this novel is how much ended up on the page unintentionally. Um, I was having a talk with my editor a couple of weeks ago about something that I, something that I, I feel sometimes, like a, a, certain kind of, um, a certain kind of nervousness. Um, and, you know, I was trying to describe it to him and he finished my sentence for me. And I said, <laughs> I said Which, have we talked about this before? He was like, no, it's in the book. And I was like, oh, <laughs> God. Um, but I, I didn't even realize it, you know what I mean? I think that, that one of the things, um, one of the most one of the things about it is that it's it's surprising what of your own what of yourself ends up on the page because you can't disconnect yourself from your art just like you can't disconnect yourself from your work i mean like you have an opinion you know you have a history um and you know regardless of what discipline you go into you are an influence on how you conduct yourself within that discipline i mean it's unavoidable i think um but uh, I, I, I generally, I like to make things up, I do. Uh, so for me, making things up was the, whole, was the basis of this, and then whatever ended up happening in there to cope, you know, whatever ended up in there as, a, as an instrument for coping with emotional strife or with the death of my grandfather, I just allowed it to surface. Uh, sometimes even without knowing that it was surfacing until much, much later. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't realize until like halfway through the book, I was like, oh, this grandfather wears glasses too. Uh -huh. um, but I, I think that it's, it's always better to, if you're writing fiction, to write fiction and then allow whatever is going to, you know, whatever yourself is going to be on the page, it's going to be there whether you like it or not. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, Going off of the backstory question, um, how did you decide which characters to give backstory to, like, or not give backstory to? And then also, were there any that you started to explore their story but didn't put in the book? Yeah, I, I, um, I think that that, that was, um, <laughs> that ended up dictated by the, you know, in some ways by the pattern of threes. Like, that was weird. I was like, oh, there will be three episodes with the deathless man during which we will learn his backstory. Then there will be three, minor characters who get major exposure. And that was weird because now, you know, now thinking about it in retrospect, like of course, like traditional, traditional mythology and traditional legends always have a pattern of threes. Like it's always about threes um, in storytelling. But I, I think that um, I always erred on the side of will this character bring anything more to the story or are we gonna learn from this character something we could know through somebody else? There were a couple of characters that I ended up compiling. Uh, because I realized, you know, there's just too many people here. They all say the same thing. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 uh, I'm a lot quicker to you know cut people out than than bring them in. So that was uh, that. Thank you. I guess two more questions. One one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have been standing in line. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Hi, um, what was your inspiration for the character Zora and what purpose did you want her to bring to the book? Uh, the character of Zora is uh, very directly inspired. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, the character of Zora is uh, uh, inspired by um, my very good childhood friend uh, who was learning to be a doctor in the Balkans at the same time that I was in college. And her stories, uh, it, and, and she was actually the reason why they were doctors in the first place, because her stories, even before I began writing the book, 
uh, you know, greatly had to do with, man, I went there today and like, he, the, like my patient has pneumonia and I'm trying to like get him to take this medicine and he, like his grandmother told him that all he has to do is put potato peelings in his socks to get rid of the pneumonia and he won't take the medicine. And so this would be, you know, hours of this conversation, um, you know, across an ocean of, of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in that, I, sh she often, in her descriptions of her time in medical school, had to walk the line of, of dealing with other people's superstitions and other people's mythologies um, in, and still trying to get them help. And uh, she's very, I mean, I think that in some ways she's very similar to the character of, of, of Zora because, you know, she's, she's very no-nonsense. And some of that stuff that I wrote in your guys' books today, she actually said at one time to a uh, mentor. There were two books that I signed today, but those people are not here. Okay, never mind. Um, it was a very aggressive comment. But yeah, so she's the inspiration for that. But I, even though the relationship between, I would like to say this, um, the, even though the relationship between Natalia and her grandfather is very similar to the relationship that I had with my grandfather, I um, don't see myself in any way being uh, similar to Natalia as a person. I actually, I actually have a lot more resemblance uh, to Darisha the bear uh, because I too look in the oven at night to see if death is there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you. The hardest part about this workshop is having to cut off questions and to stop listening to a tremendous author. Please join me once again in thanking Taya Obrecht for being here today. <laughs>